CBD FX's CBD products are formulated to boost overall wellness and deliver calm vibes for daytime and nighttime use. CBD FX uses only organically grown hemp and all natural ingredients. CBD FX's best selling line of CBD products features wellness boosting CBD and legal Delta 9 THC gummies, oil tinctures, capsules, pens, and other products. Visit CBDFX.com today and use code Genius to get 25% off site wide plus a free CBD bath bomb with your first purchase. The code is GENIUS, G-E-N-I-U-S. Don't miss this special 25% off offer for Finding Genius listeners, only at cbdfx.com. Offer expires August 31st, 2023. Feel the difference with CBDFX. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Anthony Gill, PhD. He's a professor of political science at University of Washington. And we're going to talk about the political origins of religious liberty. Uh, so it should be a very interesting call. Anthony, thanks for coming. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background and what attracted you to this area of study. Yeah, good question. I received my PhD at UCLA, and when I was looking for a dissertation topic, I was floundering around trying to find something that was really interesting in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and really couldn't. So I left graduate school for about a year and a half and just did some free reading. And in a footnote, I found a very interesting topic to explore. There was a a scholar who had noted that there's a number of Latin American countries where the Catholic bishops basically oppose military dictatorships. And everybody's studying that, but a lot of people aren't studying the Latin American countries where bishops actually supported dictatorships. And I said, well, that's an easy compare and contrast dissertation to do. So I did that, um, discovered that one of the key determinants of what made a bishop conference want to oppose a dictatorship or not was whether or not they were facing competition from Protestants who would oftentimes go to the poorest areas of uh, a country and recruit people because the Catholic Church wasn't there. And that dissertation led to my first book, but it also led to a second question. And that second question was, how did the Protestants get there in the first place? And the answer that I came up with, and and given that I studied a lot of political economy in addition to religion and politics, was that it was religious liberty. And so I wanted to understand why some countries wanted to allow for greater religious liberty or Another way of putting it, to deregulate the religious market. I put it in economics, which kind of scared some of the religious studies folks, but it's a very good way of thinking about it. And that's what led me to my second book, The Political Origins of Religious Liberty. So what are some of the conditions or preconditions that are necessary for uh, there to be religious liberty and then vice versa? What are the conditions or preconditions that that signal that it's uh, coming to an end in a particular country? Yeah. That, so let me first start with what was the main thought behind why countries initiated religious liberty. And this led me back actually to a study of uh, the United States, which was the first modern country to codify 
religious liberty, even though they had it in the Netherlands to some extent uh, prior to this. But it was the first one that was put into a constitution and, and written down. Most of the people who were studying that phenomena, why did the United States decide on religious liberty, basically said it was because they thought it was a good idea. They read John Locke, and John Locke said, oh, we should tolerate lots of other religions and things like that. So Madison read John Locke and said, well, that's a really good idea. We should have that. And he went around and talked to a bunch of other people, and everybody else says, yes, what a wonderful idea. Let's write it into the Constitution. The problem with that is that there was still a large number of people that were very hesitant to enact religious liberty. So therefore, there has to be something at work here. Uh, in fact, when it comes to James Madison, he wrote the famous uh, religious liberty clause in the, the Virginia State Constitution that formed the basis for the U.S. Constitution. And he was not a very eloquent speaker. And people on the other side were actually quite more well-versed at debating the topic. And so the, the Virginia was kind of divided 50-50 on should we have religious liberty or shouldn't we? So that led me to think about these other conditions, which you asked about here. What do we need in order for there to be religious liberty? The first condition needs to be religious pluralism. Because if everybody is the same religion and practicing the same faith and going to the same churches, you really don't need religious freedom. Right? Everybody's basically buying the same product. So yeah, no big deal. You can you know, forbid other religions, but nobody's going to care anyway. So religious diversity is really, really important here. Now that leads to another question. Well, how did the United States get religious diversity if they didn't have religious liberty to begin with, right? The religious liberty implies that there's a, an openness to other people from different faiths. Well, we all know the story of, of the pilgrims the Puritans from in England that were being oppressed by the Church of England, they fled to the Netherlands, which was a lot more hospitable to them. And then they came to the United States. So already you have some dissenters from the English Orthodoxy or the English, the, the Church of England here in the United States. What's interesting, though, is that the Puritans then started to implement laws that prevented other religions from coming in. The, the Quakers, for instance, were basically persecuted in the Massachusetts Bay Colony by the Puritans, and the Anglicans were none too friendly to other faiths as well down in the Southern Colony. So there we're still got this puzzle, why is there religious diversity coming in? And this is where the political economic explanation arises. Basically, in the United States, you have a bunch of colonies that are in need of population. A successful colony is going to need to have warm bodies, people that are there to you know, do economic tasks, to do the farming, to, to work the ports and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's a, it's a rough life to pick up from your homeland and to leave somewhere else. So you need to do whatever you can to make life more hospitable for anybody who wants to come in. And one of the conditions for this is basically allow people to practice their own faith. And this was a lesson from the Netherlands. The Netherlands learned this, you know, several decades earlier, you know, back in the late 1500s, early 1600s. They say, well, we don't really have much here, but, you know, we can trade with a lot of people. So whoever comes to our you know, country, we better welcome them with open art. Uh, and they welcomed the Catholics and the you know, Huguenots, the, the French Protestants who were being chased out of France at the time. So you're saying that the, uh, the memory was still fresh at the early formation of of America and the 13 colonies. So that's a big reason why religious liberty was put forth. Absolutely. In fact, William Penn, you know, who founded Pennsylvania and was a Quaker, uh, realized that, hey, we need to populate, populate this territory. You know, look at how the Netherlands attracted people. Let's bring people in by not chasing them away because they're the wrong faith. You also saw this as well in Rhode Island. Um, you know, he had a breakaway sect from the Puritans said, well, you know, we need to settle this place too. And, you know, we'll just kind of open it to whoever wants to come. We'll tolerate you. And again, it's a great idea. So the idea has to be there. But it was born in many ways out of economic necessity. We need to have people coming to our colonies and it's not good policy to chase them away because they believe something different. So diversity starts to take hold here. As diversity starts to take hold, people realize that, you know, certain laws that are on the books that you have to mandatorily tithe to one church are going to alienate a lot of other people. They're going to pick up from your territory and move somewhere else. And so gradually, 
just by economic necessity, people started to realize, well, you know, if we want to trade with other individuals or we want to bring other individuals in, it, it's just best to let people be what they want to be, believe what they want to be, which, by the way, is a great lesson even up to this day. CBD affects full spectrum and broad spectrum CBD products are formulated to boost overall wellness and deliver calm vibes for daytime and nighttime use. CBDFX is offering our listeners an exclusive 25% off, which I think is very generous, plus a free CBD bath bomb with your first purchase when you use the code GENIUS. Don't miss this special 25% off offer for Finding Genius listeners only at CBDFX.com. Offer expires August 31st, 2023. Feel the difference with CBDFX. Other case studies or incidences of, uh, you know, when religion was very quickly uh, allowed to be free versus very quick, you know, clamped down upon, clamped down upon, I'm sure there's plenty, but, you know, maybe one example both ways and what were the conditions that caused both? Yeah, so he, there's, well, one of the things that after studying the United States, one of the things that I, I looked at is the, the area that I was familiar with was Latin America. And I noticed that Protestants got to certain countries, namely Brazil and Chile, because, and not in other countries like Argentina or Colombia or something like that, uh, a lot of it was determined by trade again. Um, Ch Chile, which was one of the first countries in Latin America to establish religious freedom, is really hard to get to. And before the Panama Canal, you had to sail around the bottom of South America and, you know, past killer penguins in the Antarctic and things like this. So you know, the Chileans were like, hey, whatever we can do to encourage people to come here, we, we will do that. And they said, yeah, you, whoever wants to trade, if you have a faith, that's fine. You're going to stay here for a few weeks because it's a long journey. You can have your own church and everything like that. Other countries that were very trade dependent did the same thing. So Brazil was another classic example. Argentina did so as well. However, during the middle part of the 20th century, they actually reversed course. When Juan Perón came into office, he was really kind of trying to buy political capital for his you know, somewhat quasi-fascist uh, form of dictatorial rule. And he turned to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church said, well, well, we'd be happy to bless you to give you a lot of legitimacy if you can get rid of these annoying Protestants who are coming in. And so there again, out of political necessity, you see this flip-flop. They were relatively open to other religious faiths, but then it flipped during the, the prone period. Interestingly, during the prone period, prone then turned on the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church then became very, very anti-Peronist for much of the rest of the 20th century. And this what led them to actually cozy up to a number of uh, the, the two main authoritarian regimes that ruled Argentina in the 1960s, 70s, and then again in the 80s. So you, you can see how political dynamics work here. A very similar case occurred in uh, Russia as well, where in you know, Russia, after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, they're basically trying to rebuild a country and everything like that. Boris Yeltsin was in charge, and people asked him, well, what's your religious policy? And he wasn't thinking about religious policy. Religion wasn't a big deal in the Soviet Union. So he said, yeah, well, whatever you want to do. Well, not surprisingly, when you have a, a free market like that, that religious liberty in 1992-93 was really wide open in the Soviet Union. You had a number of missionaries flood in. Protestants were very quick to get in, the uh, Mormons, Catholics, you name it, flooding in. But by about the late 1980s, around 1998 or so, you start to see a clampdown on religious freedom. The Orthodox Church, which was heavily emaciated during the Soviet Union period, you went to the government at the time and says, hey, we can't compete with these folks. This is really difficult. And the government at the time, it wasn't Putin's government, but Putin was very vocal in trying to build a new Russia based upon the, the nationalist Russian history, said, you know, we're we're Russian Orthodox and we really need to champion that. And so you saw this reversal of policy from a very religiously free country from roughly 19, you know, say 91, 92 until about 1998, when the government basically said there's only going to be a handful of official religions with Russian Orthodox being the primary one, but they also allowed for Judaism, for Islam, and then also for Catholicism. None of these other churches were really direct competitors to the Russian Orthodox Church. So that was basically Putin and the Russian government at the time trying to bolster its own national legitimacy 
at a time that was rather turbulent. So, and you, you still see this to this very day, the religious market in, in Russia has not been as dynamic as it was during the early to middle parts of the 1990s. And, you know, the government today and its war with Ukraine really kind of waves the Russian Orthodox flag to bolster support for its various policies. So what makes you interested in this subject? Why is it important to you? You know, what importance does it have on the various nations in which it's changing? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple reasons that I became interested in the economic study of religion, as we call it. First of all, I learned a lot about economics by studying religion. And then people always look at me and go, oh, how can you do that? Religion has nothing to do with economics, but it's still a market process. People are exchanging you know, goods that you know, religions provide people with philosophical answers for life, and they like to be consoled by the supernatural, et cetera, et cetera. And they exchange resources and, and people try to find their own you know, personal preferences in religion. And I've discovered that religious or countries with a great deal of religious liberty are able to satisfy a lot of different preferences and tastes. And this is generally good for people. It's not only good for religious people. Say, you know, I'd like to be a Methodist, but this is a largely Catholic country. Well, allow me to be free and you know set up my own Methodist church and that would be great. So that allows people to be happier. But it's also even good for atheists, too, because atheists are allowed to, you know, openly say, I disagree with religion. So a truly religious free market is good for all faiths and as well as for agnostics and, and um, atheists. The other thing that I've discovered over time, too, and I, I wrote an article on how religious liberty tends to promote economic growth. And economic growth, the way we normally think about it, the, you know, the GDP numbers and that, is that when you have a religiously free country, People want to come there. The Netherlands understood this back in the 1600s. They said, well, we don't have very much here and, you know, in Holland and that. So we better be able to attract people by making it a friendly and welcoming place. So we'll just kind of tolerate lots of different religions. And again, people flooded in there. The French Huguenots who were you know, fleeing persecution in France, they were the French Protestants, you know, rushed over there and they were very talented people very smart entrepreneurial individuals, and also now they're in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is doing great. Um, Chile understood this very clearly in, in Latin America, is that when you let people come and trade with you and you don't arrest them because of what they believe, they actually keep coming back, enrich your country. Go figure. Right. William Penn understood this. And eventually all the other colonies in the United States understood that if you allow people to you know, practice what they believe, they will come to your country and, and business with you. More countries, are, are, I think, are learning that as well. One of the more interesting cases is the People's Republic of China, which after the, the reforms of Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s, started to not only loosen up the economic you know, what we you considered your firms and businesses loosen up on them regulatory uh, in terms of regulation, but they also started allowing people to practice their religion. I mean, people like that, and actually, wealthy business owners you know, became very faithful individuals. And you know, they went to the government. We're running a very good steel plant here. Could we just put a church on the side of this, and you know, just kind of leave us alone to practice our faith? And then, lo and behold, people are a little bit happier when they do that, and they'll tend to be more productive. Now, there's still problems in China that, you know, the Chinese government uh, you know, occasionally cracks down on a number of religious institutions and churches, especially these underground house churches that they consider a, a threat to their political power. But hopefully in the long run, they'll learn that, you know, if you just let people believe what they want, interact with who they'd like to interact with, form organizations and their own free will, people will actually be happier and more productive. And this is going to lead to a lot more economic growth. Do leaders understand this or not? It seems like a, it just seems like, you know, these things are repeating over and over and over. You know, if a leader was to come to you of some country and, and ask you for advice, what would you tell them that they wanted to monkey with the, uh, you know, the different religious groups and how religion is tolerated in a given country? That's a great question. First, I wish they would come and ask me for policy advice. Uh, one of the things you find and now when you study with uh, religion is that, you know, nobody does come to ask you for that advice. They always ask you for, you know, if you're a, a political economist, how do we boost GDP and, you know, increase steel quotas or something like that, but not so much with religion. Again, this goes back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier before is that, you know, can we, you know, promote this idea of religious freedom? And it's out there. People know that religious freedom is a, you know, virtue that is celebrated you know, internationally, but 
you know, is it just that some political leaders are too thick headed that they can't really see this? I don't think that's the case. I think it's still the case that political leaders are first and foremost interested in their own political survival. And so they're going to do whatever it takes for them to stay in power. And if they feel threatened by any kind of organized movement that is outside of their control, they're likely to clamp down on it. And you do see this in China that, you know, as long as a religion just stays out of politics and is, doesn't seem like a big organizational threat to the Chinese Communist Party, they leave it alone. But if the religion starts to become too big or if it starts to organize in ways that looks like it could potentially challenge some authority, either at national or local level, you're going to have some problem. And you see one of the, the classic examples of this is Falun Gong, which is an Eastern religion that looks very harmless. People just gather together and, and meditate in you know a public park, but they are able to gather you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people to do this. And the Chinese Communist Party looks at this as like, whoa, if you can get 10,000 people to mobilize, that could potentially be a, a threat to the church, or excuse me, to the, the Communist Party. And so we better clamp down on this religious faith. You also saw this, you know, surprisingly in Mexico. During the you know Mexican Revolution, the Catholic Church became staunch opponents of the revolutionary regime. And so the Mexican government said, OK, we're criminalizing the Catholic Church. Uh, many people don't know this, but until very recently, until the mid-1990s, all the churches that you saw in Mexico were owned by the government. Uh, they were under government control, and the Catholic Church didn't even have a legal persona, didn't have a legal status in the country. But, you know, they kind of left it be. They didn't want to push the population too far on their Catholicism, but they did keep the Catholic Church institutionally under their thumb. Back then in 1994, and this is kind of another lesson of what I've been talking about, when the Mexico wanted to negotiate the NAFTA agreement with the United States and Canada, they needed to get more support from their population. So they turned to the Catholic Church and said, hey, could you bless this policy that we're you know, doing? Could you get people to, to like this? And they said, OK, we'll do that so long as you can give us legal status and we can own property and all that stuff once again. So those laws changed back then. So when it comes to your question of, well, when do leaders learn that religious liberty is a good thing? I think when it really hits them in terms of their own self-interest politically and economically. So I could I could talk to like blue in the faith, you know, the Chinese government. Yes, you need to have religious liberty. But until it hits them in the pocketbook or they understand politically, this would be a good thing. There's probably not going to be religious liberty. When you look at the effects of uh, clamping down on religious liberty, does it usually lead to uh, regime change? Is it a death sentence for the regime in power or not necessarily or, you know, what? Does it have any positive effects or is it always negative? Or what do you see? You said clamping down on religious liberty. Yeah. I mean, for me, that I tend to like more liberty than less liberty because I trust people to do the you know right things with the freedoms that they have. So I always think clamping down is, is in general a net negative just in and of itself. Though one could make an argument that, you know, if there's religious turmoil, if there's two, you know, different religions that are always engaged in fighting, uh, one another, you might have to clamp down on one of the two sides in that. It, one might say that could be happening in India. They have a, a divide between Muslims and Hindus that you know goes back many, 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 many decades, and it, you know the rift over Kashmir and separation of, of Pakistan from the Indian subcontinent was kind of an example of this. But even when that happens, though, right? You can say, well, it's kind of a good thing because we don't want religious people fighting with one another. The problem is, is that when you let a government regulate the religious marketplace, it gets to pick winners and losers. And if it picks certain winners and the losers don't like that, it's not necessarily guaranteed that there will be a reduction in violence. And so that's always very problematic. One of the other things that I've noted too, that oftentimes causes problems with the implementation of religious liberty is that in the short run, there's oftentimes a lot of conflict. I noticed this in Latin America as, as governments started to ease up on their regulations on Protestants, more Protestants came in and Catholics got upset by this. They said, hey, you're stealing our parishioners. And sometimes it it led to violence that you know Catholic groups would go chase out Protestant missionaries and throw rocks at them and you know ban them from towns and, and do a lot of nasty things nasty things like that. But, you know, so there are these short-term costs that 
you know, one has to be cognizant of when you implement more religious freedom in a country. But in the long run, I just generally think it's a, a net positive to, to let people believe what they believe. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Are there any countries right now that you think are at a close to a boiling point or there's a, an active shift towards or away from religious liberty? Yeah, I think two of the countries I've already mentioned here is, is China. Always is interesting to look at. And I have some friends, Carrie Kasel at Notre Dame, who, is, who studied this country very deeply, and, and Feng Gang Yang in, at Purdue University. It, there's these ways, right, that at certain times the government relaxes its oppression of religious groups, but then other times it cracks down. It's been cracking down on a variety of underground Protestant churches, as well as the Uyghurs, which are you know, Muslims up in the northwest part of the country. So they're kind of at, you know, China's at a lot of different crossroads. Uh, they've deregulated economically the you know, typical sectors that we think of, but they're still trying to control the economy. Push is going to come to shove at some point in time. And it's the same thing there in the, what we call the religious economy. The other country, I think, too, to be watching is India, which, again, is you know either the second or first most populous country in the world right now. I don't know if they've surpassed China yet, but very, very important country, very economically dynamic country. And you still have a lot of tensions between Muslims and Hindus there. Muslims oftentimes kind of get the, the short end of the stick in a you know predominantly Muslim country. And again, a, a lot of governments, the Hindu nationalists tend to great enemies out of the, the Muslims during electoral times. And that's not really that good of a thing. I should just allow the Muslims to live their lives peacefully and there'll be a lot less conflict. But, you know, the political situation really doesn't allow for that at this time. You know, other places to be looking at too, you know, might be places like in the, the Middle East. We think of it as a predominantly you know, Muslim country. So, well, what do we need to have religious liberty there for and vice Muslim? But there's different types of Muslim, different flavors, different kind of quote unquote denominational differences amongst uh, Muslims themselves. And that region of the world could also benefit from that. Iran, which really, you know, clamps down on on certain types of dissent, both religious and social and political dissent, really needs to think about, you know, opening up a little bit more and allowing people to, you know, be more free, choose their own religions as the best they see fit rather than dictating it from the top down. Because, you know, in, in these countries, you oppress people to think one way and everybody conforms to that on the outside, but you never know what they're thinking about internally. And that's oftentimes when you know, you get surprises when revolutions occur. Uh, Timur Koran at Duke University wrote these, this great book on preference falsification, that when you get everybody to think one certain way, religiously, socially, however you want to cut that, you never know what they're really thinking. And, you know, suddenly they you find out that the Berlin Wall falls because nobody liked the Soviet Union and the, the Eastern Bloc communist countries. So countries have to be wary of that. And I think the big lesson out of all of this is that, you know, for your own long-term political and economic security, religious liberty is really good and liberty in general, just allowing people to speak their minds, tell you what they're thinking and behave the way that they want to behave is is really important. No, it makes sense. Are there particular religions, you mentioned Protestant, Protestantism several times. Are the Judeo-Christian religions more prone to having this strife or this close down of their freedom? Or, you know, like in India right now, I guess there's a big push for Hindu nationalism. So the Muslims are being, you know, kind of marginalized. Do you see that any religion can have this behavior or certain ones are more prone to it? Yeah. In general, I think this is a human condition. I get a lot of people asking me, well, you know, it must be Christians that are much better at, at doing this. And, you know, the Pope, you know, back in the 1960s came out for religious liberty and it's inherent in their religion. I don't think it's inherent in any religion, but rather, you know, human beings like to, especially when you have political power, like people to conform to what you want them to do. So, you know, you do see countries that have predominantly one religion. That religion will not favor religious liberty. They don't want competitors. Right? They don't want new people coming into the religious market. That Catholic showed that in Latin America. You can see Muslims showing that in the Middle East. You can see Hindus in India doing that. So it's really much more contextual. I don't, you know, I've, I've studied a lot of religions throughout my time. And, you know, you, you see people that are very, very open to religious freedom in all faiths. But also you see that their institutional leaders can become very scared of religious freedom because they have a vested interest in keeping their flock 
They want to keep as many parishioners as they can. And freedom means that sometimes you're going to lose those folks. And that's very scary to them. So it's not so much a case of a specific faith tradition, but really a situation of how much political power does a religion have. And if there's one thing that you know I do advocate for, you, you asked if I could advise political leaders about religious freedom. I would actually love to advise religious leaders because the best thing for their religious institutions is to step back from politics. It's too tempting when you get close to the government to ask the government, could you get rid of my competitors? Could you subsidize my faith a little bit more than others? That'll help me along. And keeping, basically obtaining those kind of subsidies makes you really lazy as a, a religious leader. You can count on the government to guarantee your market share or your parishioners. And that's not good. Adam Smith, some 250 years ago in The Wealth of Nations, actually had a passage in, in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations where he talked about how state churches become very lazy and repose on their benefices, as he famously said. And that's bad for that's bad for churches. I mean, the temptation is there, though. Whenever you can reach out to the government to have them do your work for you coercively, you don't have to do as much uh, work on your own. But I would tell religious leaders, you know, listen, doesn't matter if you're Muslim, doesn't matter if you're Christian, doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Jewish, whatever. Keep away from the government and just serve your parishioners. Reach out to them, talk to them, and build that kind of community. And I think that's really healthy, not only for the religions, but society as well, because it it gives a place for people to form communities outside the realm of politics. And that is actually quite a beautiful thing, I think. Well, excellent. Well, Tony, what do you see as the future of, let's say, religion in the United States, You know, the near-term future, the next you know, two to five years? Do you see any big shifts coming? And then I wanted to ask you also you know, about Europe and maybe other areas of the world that you see big shifts coming in the near term. Yeah, wow, I got to be a futurist now. I'm always worried about that. In the next two to five years, it's going to be the same old, same old thing. I think what I would say about the future is that religion will probably remain a very significant portion of human life here in the United States and many countries around the world. You know, sociologists have been talking about secularization. Uh, for several hundred years, which I've documented, you know, people saying, oh, religion is on its last knees and it's, you know, God is dead, said Nietzsche in the mid 19th century. Yeah, they even said this, you know, in the United States in the early uh, 1700s. And then we had a great awakening. You know, great awakening said there was a great sleepening and you know, everybody fell asleep for a little bit. And you see a little bit of that today. People are saying, oh, fewer young people are going to church and there's this rise of these people who are none, N O N E S. They're people who are not affiliated with any religion. Aha, the world is finally secularizing. And and that was a lot to that in the mid 1990s to about 2010, 2015. And in the past five years or so, we've seen a flowing of that trend away from religion and even a slight uptick of people coming back. It's, you know, maybe one or two percentage points, you know, increasing within the statistical range of error and things like this. But it's not as dramatic as many people make it out to be that, oh, we're all going to be secular in the next 10 years. No, religion is going to remain an important part of many people's lives because they they want to know, you know, find meaning in life. They want to know the answers to some of the big questions in life. Why are we here? Where are we going? What does it all mean? And this is, I think, true in, in a lot of other places around the globe. You see a huge explosion of religiosity in Latin America. Somebody told me that Brazil is now considered to be majority Protestant, and the Catholic Church has responded by, you know, getting more priests in there, and more people are practicing Catholics than they were, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. So that's amazing. Africa is exploding, you know, with religiosity, a Pentecostal revival in sub-Saharan Africa. In the northern parts of Africa, you know, Islam is is really taking uh, hold and, and, you know, setting is basically, you know, reaching out to a lot of people. And again, in China, communist country where people, you know, do put, put risk their lives and property to, you know, follow their own, you know, religious faith, they still do it. And so religion, I think in the short term and even in the long term, it has a, has a good looking future. I often am surprised by my colleagues to tell me, oh, you shouldn't be studying religion because, you know, there's no future. Everybody's going to be secular and non-religious in the future. And I have to remind them is that 
you know, of all the institutions, of all the human institutions throughout human history, the ones that have been most enduring have been religions. Uh, Hinduism, this, this last, you know, what, four or 5,000 years, Judaism, 3,500 years, Catholicism, Christianity, 2,000 years. And the most enduring formal hierarchy in world history is the Roman Catholic Church. And my, my colleagues, whenever I tell them that, they stop and they think, oh, wait a minute, though, there's been, you know, dynasties or empires that have lasted longer than that, right? They go, no. And one would really have to stop and think, why is that? The, why have these religions endured for so long? And if they've endured for so long, can we make a prediction that in 10, 15, 20, 50 years that these religions will disappear? I highly doubt it. The Catholic Church will outlive me and will probably outlive everybody who's being born today. It'll be around in 100 years. So my best advice to the world is to let people find their own ways, religiously or non-religiously, and let it roll. So when you say religions are likely to you know, survive for a very long time, are you thinking of specific religions? Are you mentioning Catholic Church or you, you know, religion or faith itself? Is faith itself likely to survive far longer in multiple forms than let's say maybe one religion or another is so strong that you know the major ones are really here to stay? Yeah, faith itself, I think, has endured throughout human history. Ever since, you know, human beings evolved the consciousness and looked up at the stars and and said, hey, I wonder why we're here and you know, what happens when we die. And, you know, what's what's the purpose and meaning of all this? So I, I think, you know, religious faith or you could call it philosophy, if you want, will tend to endure. There are some questions that, you know, science really, really can't answer. So science is not going to replace religion in the near future, I don't think, if, if ever. But then institutionally, right? As I mentioned, Hinduism has been around for what, I think four to 5,000 years. That's, that's a long time for a movement that doesn't necessarily have a centralized leader. The Judaism, for all the persecution and pogroms that Jews have faced throughout world history, they're still hanging around. And that's quite amazing, right? With, without any kind of central leadership in that. Uh, Christianity, uh, Islam. Islam's the new kid on the block of the major religions. They've only been around for, what, about 1,400 years, 13 to 1,400 years. And in part, I've written an article recently on this about why religions tend to endure. It's not only the fact that, you know, human beings, many human beings, maybe not all, but many human beings have this innate thirst for understanding, you know, bigger questions in life. And is there a supernatural entity that placed us here? And what's the meaning of us being at all? But beyond that, religions offer us a form of governance as well. Now, notice I said governance, not government. You know, governments are the things that we think of when you go to the Washington, D.C. Capitol or the White House, or you go to... No, I thought you said uh, governance instead of governments. Yeah, governance. So religions are very good at governance, and they do so by not having necessarily formal structures of governing or our secular governments that we think about it, but they provide a set of rules and behavioral norms that we have to adhere to. You know, and actually every every one of the major world religions has some form of what I consider to be the most basic governing rules of human uh, behavior, which is the golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's a, let you think about like, that's a really good rule. I'm going to run into a lot of situations where I don't know how to behave, but what I need to do is put myself in the situations. How would I like somebody to behave toward me? 